far? Have you? This is, this is Sunday, so praise the Lord. If it starts out bad night now, it's going to be right now. Hallelujah. But uh, no, I got a message for you this morning I wanted to go over. It's, it's something that's been uh, laid on my heart. Um, I've been going over this all week with the Lord. I've just gone different scriptures and stuff like that. I'm going to talk about some of my favorite scriptures this morning. But I want to get touch on the subject, if I can. Uh, better title of my message is Surrendering to Purpose. Let me know. Everybody in this room, everybody listening to me live stream, how many know God has a purpose for your life? This is the big question, right? What does God have for me? Uh, what does he want me to do in life? Or what do you want? And then what happens is we usually draw a blank, and then we usually say, well, I, I guess he's not going to use me for anything. And then we just step back into what we're doing. And how many ever yo-yoed back and forth and said, well, y'all, I know I got a purpose. Uh, what is that purpose? And, and uh, I'm waiting for God to lay it out. How many ever been in that place there? And uh, you've been waiting for God to lay it out right in the sky. Um, he'll send a little bi-wing plane and write it like this. It says, hello, I am God, and I'm speaking. No, he didn't do that. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want to share some things this morning. The best examples that, I've, uh, that I can pull out of Scripture are some of the, some of the patriarchs, what, they've, uh, what they actually went through uh, to work out the plan of God. One of my favorites in the Bible is David. How many has ever studied David? In, in the, any place in David's life, you can pick it up anywhere you want to. And from the, from the very beginning, where we see David coming on the scene, where Samuel uh, anoints him with oil, to the very end to where he's an old man watching the next king take over uh, for Israel. This whole life uh, seems to be one big example of how to walk out the purposes of God and how to discover those purposes. So I want to go over some of that this morning with you. And um, sound okay? Okay, praise the Lord. So by the time you leave the church this morning, you will know exactly what God wants for your life. Amen. If not, come back next Sunday. And uh, <laughs> anyway, praise, praise the Lord. No, you will. Amen. Turning your Bibles, if you will, I'm going to start off this morning. But how many know that, that uh, when we talk about uh, uh, purpose, we talk about uh, things... What we have from God is not by striving, but it's by surrender. Most of what we miss uh, in the things of the Lord is we're trying to work something out ourselves and instead of surrendering to what has already been worked out. Praise the Lord. Before you or I were even born, before we, we told Jeremiah, before you were even in your mother's womb, I had a plan for your life. God had a plan for everybody before you even were born. Before you were even conceived by your parents, God had a plan for your life. So the problem isn't not having something, a, a, a purpose for your life. Generally, it's in the uh, discovery of that purpose and how to w walk it out. Another thing, how many know we go through seasons? Times and seasons in, 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 our, in our lifetime. Matter of fact, the Bible even says that God uh, uh, controls the times and the seasonings and stuff like that. So I want to talk about a little bit of that this morning. But uh, if you will, open your Bible. One of my favorite scriptures uh, talking about David is Samuel chapter 30. Now, let me give you a little background of David. How many remember King David? And uh, this was a teenage boy who stepped out onto a battlefield and uh, took out the giant. Isn't it amazing that God did not purpose David to be a giant killer? What, did, what was God's purpose for David's life? King. king. Who said king? Wait in the back there. You're absolutely right. Praise the Lord. Give that man a gold star. <laughs> we had little stickers in a daycare. Just stick it on his forehead. Uh, but, boy, but yeah, he called, Dave, uh, David's purpose in life, God called him to be king over Israel. Matter of fact, only the second king ever to exist, the first king was, was uh, Saul. So understand that this is, was David's purpose. This is what God had purposed him for. Not only that, was David not only supposed to be king, but it was also prophesied that in David's lineage would be the lineage of the Messiah, which was Jesus Christ. So Jesus, was, so Jesus Christ, humanity was birth, in his humanity, was from the lineage of David. David's a pretty important character in, in the Bible. So we see, we see David as a teenager wandering out onto the battlefield. He's, well, he's actually he's delivering lunch for his brothers. His brothers were older than him. David seemed to be forgotten about a lot. A lot of, he was kind of pushed aside. Uh, Samuel comes to the house of Jesse, and he says, uh, he says, the Lord sent me here. He said, one of your sons is to be the next king. Uh, Saul had, uh, the anointing had 
lifted from Saul. Saul had disobeyed God, and God was already to, ready to replace uh, Saul. So you know the story. Samuel comes out, and he looks at all the sons and all the fine young men that Jesse had in his household, and he says, you got any more? Because these aren't it. <laughs> I don't know what you would do as a father, but yeah, we got one little smart little kid uh, back on the back side of the, you know, he's, he's taking care of the sheep. In other words, he's doing his chores. Call him forward. Bring him here. Of course, the prophet calls for, the, for, David, for David to come forward. And here's this young kid, and he says, he's the one. And he takes his horn of oil and pours it upon David. From that point on, David was to move into the palace, set up his king, right? Is that how it happened? Uh, sit on the throne? No. No, he had a, how many know he had a whole other life that he had to go through? But the main purpose of God for David was to be king. Did he look like a king? No. Matter of fact, he went back out and, and, he, and, he, and he, 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 he liked music, so he'd sing to the sheep. I'm sure when he's writing songs, because David wrote some of the Psalms, by the way, but it, when he's writing songs and singing, sitting out there on the, on the backside of the wilderness watching sheep, uh, uh, the prophet said, God has called me to be king. Um, king of what? The sheep? Uh, king of this? Well, what happens is we make a mistake in comparing where we're at right now to where God has called us to be. I'm going to say that again. We make the mistake, and we do the same thing to appear what we see now before us. We make the mistake, the comparison of what God has called us to be. Because even right now, as we're sitting in this church, in, in this hour, and, and of course we're, we're hearing uh, 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 vibes and different things of, of global uh, revival happen right now. Matter of fact, I was on Facebook uh, just the other day, and the, at the beginning of this month, do you know what happened in the upper room? You remember the upper room uh, in Acts chapter 2 where God poured out his spirit? There was, a, there was a group in the upper room just a couple of weeks ago, and all of a sudden they broke out in spontaneous prayer. This is the things that are happening all around the world. You know, so, so what happens is, it's, 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 if we compare where we're stuck, what we see right now to what God has called us, and if we think, well, we missed it, or, you know, I'll just wait till God bring it, brings it to pass. Maybe we'll do that. Let's just wait till God brings it to pass. The religious church taught me that. You know, hey, let go and let God. <laughs> Didn't work for me. I'll tell you right now. The fact is, I heard a preacher say this one time, and I love this statement. He says, we're praying for tables and chairs, but God makes trees. We're praying for tables and chairs, but God only makes trees. What are tables and chairs made out of? Amen. How many remember when Joshua took the people into the promised land that, that, that they were, they were uh, everything in the wilderness, they were supplied. God dropped manna from heaven. He gave them everything they needed while they were in the wilderness. Some of them remember that. And they were taken care of. Their clothes didn't even wear out. I mean, their clothes grew with them and different things like that. This is what God did. So by miracles, by supernatural means, God provided for the people. How many know the people were so appreciative of that? Yeah, <laughs> right. They begin to murmur and complain. But what happened now... From the wilderness to where Joshua led the people into the promised land, what changed? Something changed drastically. No longer did God just provide for the people in, uh, like he did in the wilderness. In the promised land, they had to till the ground. Matter of fact, when he split the river Jordan again, and he picked up 12 stones and he built an altar on the other side of the promised land as they, as they made their entrance, they brought the Ark of the Covenant across it. All 12 tribes went across unto the promised land. And immediately, immediately, the, the, the manna that fell from heaven stopped. There was a change in everything that happened. And God says, okay, you want to eat now, you till the ground. That wasn't a punishment. That was God's advancement because he says, you till the ground and I'll cause a supernatural uh, harvest to come that will bless your socks off. And this will be your land. And we'll, we're going to co-labor together in this land. And this is what God has brought from the very beginning. Are you here? So what happens is when we talk about this purpose that God has for us, I'll get back to David in a minute, talk about this purpose that God has for us, we forget sometimes that there's something for us to do. 
There's something that God is waiting for us to do so that he can move on our behalf and bring those things to pass that he's wanted to bring to pass from the beginning. Why is it that way? I don't know. So he's God. He does what he pleases. Psalms 150. <laughs> but I mean, this is what it, what it is. This is he, he desires. Could God do it himself? Of course. He doesn't need anybody. He's a deity. He has no lacks or deficiency. He doesn't need anybody. But he desires to work through us. And that plan that God has for our life is what we're walking out day by day, looking at what God has, has, has planned for us. Amen? Amen? So what happens is people of faith are forward-looking, not necessarily on what they have in their hands right now, but where God is about to bring them. Because if you can believe the purpose and the plan that God has for your life, there is something better than you're living right now. And you might be living really good. But the fact is, God always has something, some kind of improvement or advancement on the horizon for us and for his people. I don't know about you, but I want in on that plan. You can, you can play around with the devil, steal, kill, and destroy if you want to. I'd rather have God in his abundance is what I'd rather do and move into that advanced life. And everybody has a choice. Jesus said this in John 10, 10. He said, the thief comes but only to kill, steal, or destroy. So everything that's been stolen from your life, everything that's been killed in your life, everything that's been uh, uh, you know, destroyed in some way, shape, or form hasn't been God. It's been the stinking devil. Are you here? <laughs> okay. But all I know is everything good in my life that I can not say good from my marriage to my, raising my kids, to everything that happens, everything good in my life has come through the hand of God. And it's come by serving him being in his church. So I, I'm going to tell you right now, even back when I first got born again in a religious church, God did something good there too. So I can look at nothing bad when I'm talking about church, because even the things that challenged me in church brought me to a place where God wanted me to be, and he began to, I'll testify about me if you want to, but the fact is, is, it is, it is nothing but good has ever come out of church for me. Amen. Amen? So everything that God has in his hand to give to me has, nothing been, has been nothing but good. However, there was a season in my life I did serve the devil. In my own, through my own flesh, not as a, as a devil worshiper, but as my own flesh. And it wasn't, so, that, it wasn't quite so. It was a life of misery. It was a life of, of punishment and lack. Until one day, Jesus began to turn that thing around. Let me get back to David. David was anointed king. He was an outcast in his own family. The prophet had to call him forth, had his, father, they'll call him forth. So he was kind of an outcast. Amen. He anoints him and says, you're going to be the next king. David said, that's nice. He goes back into the field taking care of his sheep. One day there was a battle and the Philistines were squaring off with Israel. You know the story. And this young boy goes ahead and he pushes the lunch wagon or, or, or the lunch burrow, whatever he had, brought his lunch to his, to his, um, to his brothers that were fighting in the Israeli army. Uh, basically, back then, they didn't have a mess hall. The army didn't give you your food. Your family did. So it was David's job to, as a Aaron to go there. All of a sudden, he hears this something, this, this big old thundering voice that begins to curse his God, curse everything about his nation, curse everything that, that was dear to David and was considered blessed. Understand something. The enemy has nothing but curses for you, and that's all they want to do is mouth off all the things that you hold dear to your life that, 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 that God has given you. Amen? Amen? David, all of a sudden, he gets in. Now, I don't see any place in that scripture in 1 Samuel 17 where, 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 where you know, uh, he goes ahead, let me go ahead and see, get the prophet to see what he wants me to do about this giant. I don't see any of that. Matter of fact, I don't even see David asking permission. He does go to the king, and the king offers him his sword and his armor, which David put off. He said, no, I haven't proven those things. I, can't use, I can only use what I got. He didn't try to be something else, even though he had within him the prophet's message that you're going to be king. You know the story. He squares off with the giant. The giant tells him, oh, yeah, sure. You're gonna, I'm gonna, he said, I'm going to feed your carcass to the buzzards. That's a Kevin Kerr paraphrase, by the way, but he said the fowls of the air means the same thing. I'm going to kill you and feed your, feed your <laughs> bones to the buzzards. And David said, no, quite the contrary. My God this day will deliver you into my hands, and I'm going to do the same to you. 
Are you here? So this is what, how, how it goes back and forth. Nobody told David to do that. There was no prophet that laid hands on him. I'm prophesying you're going to take the giant out this day and, and, and the giant's never going to be a problem to you again and so on and so forth. None of that stuff. He just did it. He did what was passionate in his heart. What God had placed there, the seed, rose up and he began to take this on. Did he look like a king? Matter of fact, uh, if I kill a giant, couldn't I go ahead and put it on my business cards? Uh, Covenant Word Church, Pastor Kevin Kerr, giant killer. <laughs> sounds good. It's even, I mean, it rolls off the lips, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds good. Did David do that? No. Matter of fact, killing the giant really had nothing to do with him being king. What happened first before he ever became king is he had a heart towards God that was so inflamed for the Lord, so zealous for the Lord. Anything that came against what God was saying, David attacked because of his passion for the Lord. Amen? Amen. And God supernaturally saw to it. But he didn't become a giant killer. Matter of fact, that's the only, that's a, that was a one and done. We never heard about David killing another giant. And David didn't even take on the Philistines. Uh, Israel finally stepped up, but he saw what a boy could do to the giant. They said, well, look how strong we are, and our God will, will supply it. And, and ran them all the way back to, to Zekah, uh, the Philistine stronghold. Some of them, they went past that and ran them clear uh, to the Gaza Strip, clear to the, to the Mediterranean where they came from. Amen. This is this David. Now all of a sudden, David finds himself in the courts of Saul. Uh, uh, I'll step up this story a little bit. In the courts of Saul, and basically he does so well because God is with him. He does so well that this Saul gets jealous and wants to kill David and makes David a fugitive in his own country. Does this look like the plan of God for your life? <laughs> now, they, God didn't, told Saul to do this. Saul wasn't operating on what God was telling him to do, but David was. So David goes ahead and he flees his country. Get this. Where does David flee? He has to leave the borders of Israel. So where does he find refuge? Are you ready for this? He finds refuge with the Philistines. <laughs> Remember the giant? <laughs> and he found favor with a Philistine king. He actually gave him his own city. He said, here, Ziglag is yours. This is what you want to do with it. Well, of course, the Philistines, eventually, they got, they got really tired of this. They said, we don't trust David. David had 600 men followed him wherever he wanted to do. With 600 men, David was wiping out the enemies of Israel that the army of Israel couldn't wipe out because God was with them. So he had great success. Wouldn't we take from that that God maybe doesn't really want me to be king. Maybe the prophet got it wrong. Maybe he wanted me to be a warrior. Yeah, that's it. I'm not really, Saul's king. I'm not really supposed to be called king. See, if we look at the circumstance of where we're at right now, it may look different than what God says because there is no way, shape, or form that you can get from here to where God says without God's intervention. If you could, it wouldn't be God's will for your life. It would be your will for your life. So what happens, the call of God is going to look like this unreachable thing that we can do nothing about. So what happens is a lot of times we don't do anything about. And that also is equally as wrong if we try to step off in the wrong direction. I'll show you why. Praise the Lord. So here's David. He's on one of his raiding parties. He comes back. People don't realize this. I can just put a little highlight in here. People don't realize this. David didn't ride horses. Matter of fact, horses were under the ban for Israel. Why were they under the ban? Because the only ones that had horses that they could buy from were Egyptians. They could ride uh, donkeys. Those were okay. They could breed them themselves. But horses they didn't have. So when they say David went from here to there, it was on foot. <laughs> so let's get David had 600 foot soldiers that were following him so basically they came home one day and they found out that the Amalekites had come in and burned down their village taken all their flocks taken their women and their children didn't kill them just took all their women and their children and left David with nothing no city no wives no children no, no, no uh, um, uh, sheep no goats no, no nothing no, no crops burned all the crops clear everything 
Basically, David had come home from a campaign of doing God's will. This king that the prophet had poured oil on and said, this is going to be the next king of Israel, now finds himself homeless. He finds himself rejected, and he finds himself with nothing, not even his wife and family. Now, can I pick up the story from there? 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6. That's the background of it. Now, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. I guess they would. They were a little ticked off. David, we followed you. You're supposed to be a man of God. You're supposed to hear God all the time. We followed you, and this is what we get for following the Lord. This is what we get for, 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 for carrying out the God's plan. Oh, yeah, this is a great day, David. We're so, this is a great... We ought to take you out and stone you right now for getting in his, in his position. How many see, see that? So David didn't even have his 600 men as friends. <laughs> so David is sitting now all by himself, looking like the furthest thing away from a king of Israel. What was God doing in David? He wasn't making a giant killer because he never killed another giant. He wasn't making them an ally of the Philistines to try to bring those tribes together. So he wasn't an ambassador of no kind because God didn't do that either. What was he doing? On the inside, what Saul was, was doing, and Saul didn't even realize it, but Saul himself was building the next king of Israel to take his place and didn't even realize it. Because all this time, David is watching the hand of God move and he's getting stronger and stronger and stronger as a leader. Not as a person by himself, not as a person who wants to live in comfort, but as a person who's about to, to, to move in to lead a nation. Amen? Amen? David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved. <clears throat> Hallelujah, in verse 6. Every man for his sons and his daughters. But listen to this. I've, I've preached on this before. Listen to this. I'm going to add some other stuff to it. So just listen, hear me out. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. I wasn't really strengthened, means to establish himself, to secure himself in the Lord. How does it, what does that mean to strengthen yourself in the Lord? Does it mean to go to church? Does it mean, it could mean all that stuff. But basically what it means is to establish what God has said over your life. What I do, and what I, I've got prophecies that are spoken over me 30 years worth of, or, or more, I get them out and I reread them. I look at God, what you said here, this looks like the furthest thing from what you said over here. So I'm going to fix my mind over here and I'm going to look at what God has planned for me, not what I see in the natural right now. I'm not going to live in my circumstance. I'm not going to live in my defeat. That's stupid. Amen? But I'm going to live in what God has said. Oh, you're a dreamer. Oh, God has never, how long has it been? How many knows all the, all the ploys of the devil? It <laughs> doesn't matter because basically God's made me eternal. So time doesn't really matter. Amen? I mean, look at me now. I'm 40 years old and look, just got going on strong. All right, I lied a little bit, but praise God. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. <clears throat> praise the Lord. David strengthened himself in the Lord. He established himself in his God. Then, this, then listen, that's first, right? Let's take the order of things. David strengthened himself in the Lord. Then, it says in verse 7, then, I put it in highlights and underlined it. Then, it was then. So this, this then follows the first thing that he did. Now comes another thing. David said to Abathar, the priest, he said, Amalek's son, he said, he says, bring me the, e bring the ephod here to me. What does that mean? Well, in Jewish terms, <clears throat> I showed you before, ephod is a priestly garment. It could have been a, a, the prayer shawl. It could have been lots of different things. What was David doing? He says, okay, now that I've strengthened myself, I established myself in what God has said, now I'm going to go over here and inquire from the Lord. Do you notice? Because I've heard this preached the other way. I said, well, he, he went to the Lord, and the Lord strengthened him. No, he strengthened himself first before he ever talked to the Lord. He pulled himself up, as the saying goes, by his own bootstraps. I'm going into the presence of God. I don't care what you guys say. I don't care what you do. Just try stoning me. We'll see what happens. I'm going into the presence of the Lord. I've been established by him to be the next king. The oil is poured over me by the prophet Samuel, who is still a prophet today. 
who t leads Israel, by the way, he says, and he has said, I'm going to be the next king. I don't care what the circumstances look like. I'm going to inquire the Lord what I should do next. Here's what we should take a lesson from. Forget what your problems and the situations you're going through now. Say, no, the Lord has spoken this over me, and now I'm going to step into what he has given me. I don't know how to do that. Because what now, what now, it looks like nothing but defeat. It looks like I'm, I'm toast here. If, if, if God, oh, God's got to do something. He's got to step in. He, David didn't know that. Give me the ephod. I'm strengthened. I'm established now. I'm established in the fact. Now bring me the ephod. Because the other role that I have, David had three roles. Number one was king. Number two was prophet. And number three was priest. He could eat the showbread in the temple without dying. <laughs> so, there were, so David had it he, he knew where he was now let me establish the priesthood and let me go into the prayer closet put on my ephod and talk to the Lord and ask the Lord what I should do so David has a conversation with the Lord as we see he put the ephod in, and so Abathar brought him the ephod to David and David inquired the Lord saying this is what he said to the Lord shall I pursue this troop it seemed like a no-brainer. I don't even know if I would have waited for the Lord to say, okay. I think I would have been running, put my track shoes on. I'd be going after them guys. I would probably depend on the Lord to get me out of the situation I just got myself into. <laughs> Once I got there. But no, you know, he says, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered and, and, he answered and said, pursue. This is God speaking back to David. Pursue. Now I've got a word of the Lord. Now I've got God's will in this subject. He said, pursue. You shall surely overtake them. And this is what God adds. Without fail, you recover everything that they've stolen from you, all the stock, all the women, all the children. You bring them back. You get all of them and you recover them. Listen to me. What am I going to do with them? What am I going to do? My village is burned down. I don't have a city. The Saul wants to kill me. What am I supposed to do? He never asked. He just went ahead. Yes, I'm going to recover all. That was a command of the Lord. David didn't put that command before. Oh, can I recover him? No, he didn't say it at all. He said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Why? From, a, from an area of strength, he approached the Lord. What do we, how do we approach the Lord to this day? We approach the Lord in an area of weakness. Why do we approach the Lord in the area of weakness? Because we're overtaken by our problems. Our problems have weakened us. Not your faith, your problems. When David strengthened himself in the Lord, he got his call straightened out. He got his faith back up and said, Lord, what shall I do now? He says, pursue, overtake, and recover all. David had to move from distress to strengthen, from strengthen to pursue. Nothing changed in David's life until he finally got a word from the Lord and began to pursue that. Nothing he was still as broke as he was before. He was still as homeless as he had ever been, More, worse than he's ever been. At least at the house of Jesse, he had a, three squares and a, and, and a roof over his head at home. He don't even have that anymore. So, But he did not come from an area of weakness. He came from an area of strength. But God says it begins when you pursue. And don't you know it? When God says something and we get on the path, yeah, we got all Prepped up, I got my 600 men. Let's go get them, guys. And all of a sudden, he gets to a certain place, and 200, that's one-third of his force, say, no, nah, we're not going any further. We can't, we can't make it. We can't make it. We're too tired. We can't make it. We can't make it. All right? He said, you guys stay here. 400, come on with me. And he begins to pursue. What happens? He finds an Egyptian that was cast aside by these Amalekites. He says, if you don't give me back to my master, if you take care of me, because they left him for sick. They were slowing him down. So he said, they took him on. They showed him kindness. And he says, you, we'll give you your freedom if you show us where this troop is at. He says, sure. Deal. <laughs> See, in our haste, how easy is it to walk past the answer that God has just provided on the where-tos of where we're supposed to be. Amen. How easy is it to walk by with our focus on one thing and just walk by that thing? 
What was David's purpose, God's purpose now? Was it still king? Absolutely, he never just that. But now David has a purpose within a purpose. His purpose was to set people free, and he's going to start with his own people. Amen? And he used that every method, every means at his disposal, and God provided another one, the insight, the intel of where this band was. And he goes after them. I don't know about you, the Bible doesn't say how many Amalekites there were. Thousands could be. But you figure it out. How many Amalekites would it take or how many people would it take to watch all the women and children, all of them in a whole village of 600 men, all their wives, and how many Amalekites would it take to watch all their flocks so they don't scatter all this, they can keep everything together? Just to supply what they've stolen from David, how many men do you think it would take to keep to corral all that stuff, not counting the soldiers that would have to fight to protect. I would say David was outnumbered at any any rate. But God likes to work that way. He worked that way with Gideon. He likes to work. Why? Because he's really touchy about us taking the credit for what he's done. When we become so puffed up in the credit, then God really has has an exception to that. So David was to the point that there was no way, no way that, God, that he could say, I did this all on my own. It's because I'm such a great warrior and giant killer. See, David had to handle, David had to handle the victories. Sometimes it's easier to handle the defeats than it is the victories. Amen? Praise the Lord. How are we doing so far? David's purpose we never would have unfolded if he hadn't have done all the things and had the victories that God has given him. But it wasn't just a victory. It was victory after victory after victory. Do you remember when David finally set up as king and he was in the city of David and, 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 and basically uh, uh, he, he brought, tried to recapture the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines and take it on a cart and, and basically that was not God's way. It cost a man's life because it wasn't God's way of dealing with it. David did it on his own. And the, the ark rested in a man's field, the threshing floor. And uh, God, uh, David inquired of the Lord. When David got, it says in Chronicles, first Chronicles, when David got to the threshing floor, there was an angel standing there with a sword drawn. Now, I don't know if you ever read about Hezekiah, you ever read about uh, Jehoshaphat. One angel can wipe out 300,000 men easily. One angel. And when he got to the, to the threshing field, he, of course, he talked to the, the owner. He says, oh, I'm going to pay it. Six, uh, six shekels of, of gold he paid for the field. And he says, no, we'll just give it to you. The king. We'll give it to you. No, no, no. He said, I cannot give to the Lord what has cost me nothing. See, in co-laboring, we forget about that. We, we give to the Lord. Can't give to the Lord a sacrifice. There's an old saying that says this. It says, the Lord likes the fires of the altar but it's the priest to keep the fires burning. The Lord, it, it comes from Leviticus chapter 9, I believe it is, and, but it, it talks about the Lord starts the fires of the altar, but it's up to the priest to keep things burning all the time. What God is looking for, the, we've kept non-flammable stuff on the altar for years. The one flammable thing God wants to keep is this with Paul brings it out in Romans chapter 12. He says, present yourself a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, without blame. That goes on the altar of the Lord. So the fire comes from God, starts from God, but it's the priest, it's the priest. It's us to keep it burning. Amen? When David got to the field, the angel had his sword drawn. This is David now. This is the great giant killer. When he paid for the field, And he began to bring the peace offering. He worshiped the Lord. He built an altar, and he worshiped the Lord in that place there. The angel put his sword back in the sheath. (laughs) I love the graphics that the Bible brings out with this thing. So he puts his sword back in the sheath. David worships the Lord, and God lights a fire again right on that altar. And David presents a peace offering. Then God tells him how he wants the Ark of the Covenant handled when he brings it back to Jerusalem. I'll kind of fast forward on you. But the point of being that until David moved from the spot he was in, 
God's purposes never did unfold. Amen? Praise the Lord. It says a lot. Now, notice that when David went to the Lord, a couple of things I want to notice. David went to the Lord. He didn't give him a detailed message or a detailed plan. Well, here's what you do. First you do this, then first you do that. How many are looking for a detailed plan? Write it in the sky, Lord. Uh, give me, show me a sign. Let a dove float down and land on my shoulder. Yeah, crap on your head. Praise the Lord. But <laughs> we, we, we get spiritually like, well, you know, God can do that if he wants to. He doesn't want to. I can tell you right now, he never wants to. What he wants, okay, he wants us to build the furniture from the trees that he provided. Amen. Did I share that with you? It's we're praying for chair, tables and chairs and God provides trees. I heard a preacher say one time, praise the Lord. Amen. Nothing changed for David until he was on the path that God told him to, go, to be on. He says, you pursue. Now I, got a, now I got a path. He says, you will overtake. He said, and you will recover all. You will do that. That's the will of God to recover everything that the devil has stolen from you. It's God's will for you to recover all, but you got to do it his way. Amen. Hmm. Praise the Lord. Amen. Nothing changed from David as long as he didn't move. See, the glory of God brings transformation. The righteousness of God brings revelation. Can I share one other thing with you? I want to, can I bump you up? I got, yeah, I got eight minutes. I can do this. Uh, I, I want to bring you up to the New Testament where Jesus did the same thing. Jesus walks up to uh, uh, some, some fishermen sitting by the Sea of Galilee. And basically, he says this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. He says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Does anybody know what that means? I mean, we can, walk, we can look at the whole thing. Of, now, they fished back then. They didn't fish with rod and reels. They fished with nets. They threw nets over the side. Remember when Jesus told Peter, he says, he says cast out into the deep and lower your nets? Do you know that was, was not a qualified answer? Because what happens if it gets deeper than the bottom of the nets, the fish just get out. But that's not what happened when Jesus, the nets filled up and the boat filled up. Because Peter did it on the word of the Lord, not on his qualifications as a fisherman. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He walked up to Matthew, a tax collector, and he says, just follow me. He didn't promise me, follow me. Okay. Everybody that followed Christ at the command of Christ following them changed their life. Their life never became the same again. Even when Peter went back to fishing, when Jesus was crucified, he thought it was all over and all their three years of, of, of training was all done with. He went back to, to fishing and it didn't work out. Jesus shows up on the bank and he's already cooking fish if you look at the story. He didn't need Peter's fish. He needed Peter. Didn't really need Peter, but this is what it's called with Peter. Are we trying to cook fish that Jesus already has? Hmm. Just, just a question. Praise the Lord. Jesus' invitation bore with it the qualifications needed, even though they didn't know what that meant. Now, are you following? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I give you Luke chapter 5, which says, launch out into the deep, let your nuts out in. And Simon answered him and said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, it's your word I'll let down the nets. Jesus' instruction seems to be one without qualification, but the word supersedes the qualifications dictated by the natural order. In other words, when Jesus gives you an answer, it doesn't have to fall in with nature. <laughs> he is nature. <laughs> so basically, listen, we've toiled all night, and you want us to go out deeper. The fish are going to get out. It's not going to work. But because you said so, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and what happened? They had to get help to haul the nets in. It was so much fish. Why? Because he operated not on what his understanding of fishing was. Where Jesus had no understanding of fishing, he was a carpenter, they could have said. 
Instead, he had insight to the supernatural, and the supernatural instruction that Jesus gave went past the natural. It superseded the natural. So what happened was, this is what my take is on the stuff I'm giving this morning. We don't just get to do God's purpose when he says so. No, we submit to him. And we surrender to that purpose idea. We surrender to his purpose. And when we surrender to his purpose, we will see things we can't imagine. Oh, what seen would have been done. Amen? Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 16. You all know this scripture. I'm giving you some familiar ones this morning. He says, he says and I also say unto you, Peter, on this rock I'll build my church. The gates of Haiti will not prevail against it. How many know that story? Oh, yes, Peter Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this rock, this revelation, I'll build my church in the gates of hell. So here we are. We're at Covenant Word Church in Key West, and we're waiting for God to build his church. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't read the rest of the verse. That's right. Verse 19, he says, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth It'll be loose in heaven. Oh, wait a minute. We got a part in this thing? <laughs> you mean we got to loose and bind stuff? Oh, really? Praise the Lord. Amen? Daniel, one of my favorite scriptures, Daniel eleven thirty two. 32, it says, he says, those who do wicked against the covenant, uh, uh, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. The people that know their God. Amen? Are we here? Paul echoes this word in Timothy, uh, to, to Timothy. Timothy, if you know the story, uh, Paul was an apostle over the church of Ephesus. Ephesus, by the way, was a church that Paul never wrote a rebuke to. The only one in all Asia Minor he never rebuked. So Ephesus had a pretty good, pretty good uh, bead on what was, what was happening. Anyway, he told Timothy. Timothy was being sent there as a pastor. But he was a young man. He was sent there as a pastor of the church of Ephesus by Paul. Paul wrote this while he was in prison, by the way, just so you know that. Amen? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, preach the word, be ready, in season, out of season. He says, convince, rebuke, exhort, all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. He said, but whatever season it is, keep preaching the word. Paul knew that was a key to all the things that we need to do. Keep preaching the word. Keep preaching the word. He said, by according to their own desires. He said, because they had itching ears, they heap on themselves teacher, teacher, uh, teachers. Uh, uh, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn to fables. I put this up in, 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 the, in the translation, in the Passion Translation. It says it this way. Proclaim the word of God and stand upon it, no matter what. Rise to the occasion and preach when it is convenient and when it is not. Well, I like that. <laughs> preach in full expression of the Holy Spirit with wisdom and patience as you instruct, teach the people. For the time will come when they will no longer listen and respond to the healing words of truth because they will be selfish and proud. They will seek out teachers with soothing words that will line up with their desires, saying, just what they want to hear. And verse 4 says, they will close their ears to the truth and believe nothing but fables and myths. Sounds like what we're living in today. Amen? Praise the Lord. I think he was talking about today. Amen. <laughs> he also says this, that the, he says, don't, he says in, in Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 30, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit he says two things. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, and he says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Those are two different words in the Greek. Those are two different expressions. What does he mean? To grieve the Holy Spirit, these are the things we should stay away from. To grieve the Holy Spirit is through wrong activity. When we do something sinful, that grieves the Holy Spirit. To quench the Holy Spirit is when we just fail to cooperate. <laughs> You want me to repeat that? <laughs> to grieve the Holy Spirit is when we do stuff wrong, when we just go out and sin. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is within us. But to quench the Holy Spirit is that's something I'm not going to cooperate. 
I'm going to do my own thing, don't care what anybody says, and that's it. The Bible says that quenches the spirit. Okay, well, praise the Lord. I was doing good up to that point. Amen. He also said, well, here, this will make you happy. He also said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31, he said, earnestly desire the best gifts. Do you know what God tells us to do? He says to earnestly pursue the expressions of God. Holy Spirit gifts are expressions of God. He says pursue the expressions of God. So grieving and quenching has something to do to hinder the expressions of God in our life. How are we doing so far? Uh Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. I don't care. I still think it's a good message. (laughs) You can poo-hoo all you want. You know it's the truth. Amen. Amen. Nobody's poo Oh, you liked it. It was good? Okay. Should I start from the beginning again? (laughs) Don't egg me on, Christian. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. Well, I'll give you one more scripture. One more scripture. I'm out of time, but I'll give you one more. Can I give you one more scripture at this point? Okay. Second, uh, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2. It goes along with the same lines. It says, now the Spirit speaks expressly. That's a tongue twister. But now the Spirit speaks expressly. says that in latter times, sons shall depart from the faith, giving heed to, to deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils. You notice it doesn't say that to depart from the faith, listen to God. It doesn't say that some will depart from the faith listening to God. Now, the Spirit, capital S, says expressly that some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies, hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. I shared last week what the conscience is. A conscience is not just that thing that makes you feel guilty and real bad about yourself. That's not what I'm talking about. The word conscience means it's a present idea, persisting notion, impression of reality. It's an inward moral spiritual framework. So in other words, your idea or your perspective of looking at something becomes corrupt. And your conscience becomes corrupt. Amen? You say, I don't see anything wrong with that. Well, good. You didn't see nothing wrong with that. So I guess it's right for everybody. Or what does the word say? See, I, I, I stopped a long time ago trying to come up with my own opinions. <laughs> and just started looking. Okay, Lord, I, I'm, I'm to the place David was. I want to pursue uh, uh, the next thing, I want to pursue the plan and purpose you have for my life. What am I supposed to be doing? Now, he's going to tell me what I'm supposed to be doing right now. How many know you're looking at me right now? I'm doing exactly what the Lord told me. This is part of my gift. This is part of my calling. Do not confuse gifting and callings. They're two separate things. People do a lot with their gifting because it's easy for them. And I'm going to tell you something. You could use your gifting and not be in the purpose of God. Matter of fact, you can follow your gifting so far, the thing that you're so talented about and so proud of, and go completely the opposite direction of God. Amen? Here's how we tell the difference is when we start backing off and we figure, we don't need God. We can do this. I got this one, God. You know, when you want to get carnal. I got this one, God. I'll pick you up on Sunday morning. I'm going to punch you out, and I'm going to repent later. How many of you? No? Nobody? Okay. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's not biblical at all, and it isn't God's leading at all. It's those situations that we, that we are tempted in and we fall short of the promises of God. So what do we do? Say, so, Lord, I don't understand this. I have no, I don't even, when I, I said this 33 years ago, I don't know why you want me in Key West. I was not from this place. I wasn't born here. I had no friends here. Why, why Key West? And then, then after two or three years, I said, why am I still here? <laughs> it didn't make sense. The other day I was thinking about the thousands of people that have come through this church going some other places, many of them foreign nations. Do you know right now they mentioned the, the ladies' Bible study? We have, we have ladies that are Zooming in our Bible, uh, not the Bible study, the women's, uh, women's meeting. For, I don't know, I'm not a woman, so I don't go there. But um, uh, the, the, Zoom, the people Zooming in from Jamaica. I got a following in Jamaica. Amen. Whoever thought that went there once on a missionary trip. They never think I'd go back. It's the things that we dismiss in our life. It may be just the things we need to reevaluate again 
Because are we trying to do what we want to do or are we trying to do what God wants us to do? You see, we're told from this time, this high, uh, I, I remember saying these words to my son, you're smart. You can, do, you can be anything and do anything you want to do. God corrected me in that. And when he got older, I says, I'm, that, was, that was not right to tell you that. That was wrong. Because what I should have said, I should have said, you are smart, you are intelligent, and you have a, fine, a, a sensitive spirit. You can do everything God has called you to do. Amen. That's what I should have said. Of course, I, re, I reversed right, and, and did say that. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. It's not just about you being smart, not just about you being talented, but you can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We have to keep going back and submitting ourselves, surrendering. Faith is not by striving. It's, from, it's by surrendering. We surrender to the call of God and what he's placed on us. The prodigal son came home because he finally surrendered to what the father was telling him. And when he surrendered, it brought him back to the right path of where his inheritance was. Your inheritance and my inheritance is not the world. Okay, your inheritance and my inheritance is heaven. Heaven owns this planet. Our Father owns everything that you're standing on, everything that you're driving. He owns it all. It all belongs to him. But our inheritance is heaven. And Jesus said this in, in, in that prayer that uh, they were singing about this morning. It says, Lord, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Well, how is that going to get done? When he's determined he's not coming back here until it's, it's over. So that's his people. Why do we give our hearts to the Lord and why are we still here? Because we have a job to do. Amen. Giving your heart to the Lord and receiving the salvation of Christ, whoop de doo You received something free that was given to you. Big deal. You don't get a Nobel Peace Prize for that. Hallelujah, you finally got both feet in the kingdom. Now let's do something. That was only bringing you to the preparation point of what he's called us to do. All right. I got more, but I got to stop here next Tuesday. I'm going to get something out of the message this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm excited of what God is doing in this hour. And even in my old age, I am not going to miss out. I want to be like, I want to get a Caleb spirit about me. Amen. Give me my own mountain. <laughs> no, I don't need any young whippersnappers. <laughs> Give, turn it over to me. No, no, no. Give me my own mountain. Remember Caleb, he went to Joshua? Joshua? I was young and old. He said, my sight hasn't failed me, nothing failed me. He said, I'll give me my own mountain. He said, which one you want? He said, the one there where Arbaugh's at. Arba? He said, that's a mountain full of giants. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Give me the mountain full of giants. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. Let's stand to our feet. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. How many want to know the will of God for their life? How many want to know the will of God for their life? Hmm? Raise your hand if you want to know the will of God for your life. Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> man, I used to think that in a religious church. I used to think, man, if I ask God for his will, he's going to put me in some third world country someplace as a missionary. I used to think that was the worst assignment God can give me until I went to a third world country as a missionary. <laughs> now, that's all what he did. Basically, I was just there. I, I could preach and run. Uh, but let me tell you some, some of the most blessed things that I thought were some of the worst things. I used to listen to the religious missionaries come back. They, had, they were short of everything, never had anything, never saw any miracles. Never saw, it just, and that was about it. But God brought me to the mission field where, he, where I experienced some powerful miracles and healing and so, so like that. I said, yeah, I love this. I could do this. But God says, no, you're called to Key West. Why? <laughs> so now I'm arguing the other way, praise the Lord. But this is what he, what he has. It isn't so much that we, dis, that we get to choose what God will use us for based on our strengths. Did you, did you get that part? It's submitting to God for a life that he's already uh, planned for us. Amen? Amen? Was David's life a life of ease? No. There was a battle involved, but it was a good fight. Why? Because he won. He won every fight. 
He battled every one. What's so bad about a fight if you're always winning? Unless you're just lazy. That's another issue. But praise the Lord. If we're, if, what's wrong with a fight, getting in a fight? But we have to depend on God to get us out. Amen? So I heard one guy tell me one time, he said, you're going to be a pastor in Key West. Well, you better know it's God. Why? What if it isn't? What if I go down there? What if Peter stepped out of the boat and nothing happened? He just swung himself back to the boat, cough out the thing, and find, yes, find out what he did wrong. But he didn't. He walked. He walked, and when he got in fear, he sunk. When he got drawn to the wrong world, he sunk. I didn't get to preach this this morning, but I, I wanted to. Stop rebuking things that aren't the devil. Amen? Amen. The devil's not always responsible for our bad moods, is he? Stop rebuking things that you don't know the devil. Jesus was on the bow of the boat saying, peace, be still. He didn't say, I rebuke you in my own name. I rebuke you, Satan, for starting this storm. Did he? No. He said, peace, be still. And then he turned to those, says, Where is your, where's your faith? In other words, you're in storm calming training. Where were you? Amen? Praise the Lord. Peace be still. He didn't say, uh, I, I rebuke you. Now, when he met Satan on the, on, the, on the, I call it the battlefield, but in the wilderness, it's a different story. Get you behind me, Satan, he said, because it was Satan behind the whole thing. Finally, when he said, no, you got to tempt the Lord. Amen? Let me pray for everybody here this morning. That The word comes clear that God begins to uh, unfold his plan for your life. Is that okay? Is that yeah. okay? Uh, uh, it, but God begins to unfold the plan for, for your life. And uh, we're here to help you. If, if you don't belong to a church, be part of a church because you know, the world's not going to show you the will of God. <laughs> Quite the opposite. And they couldn't if they wanted to because they don't know it. That's, that's privileged information that God has in the kingdom. You've got to be in the kingdom to learn that. Privileged information, praise the Lord. But he does have a will for everyone that's ever been born. Hallelujah. Father, we just pray this morning in the name of Jesus to unfold that people's hearts. Things that we wondered about over the years, Lord, things that require action upon and help us discern the difference. There's some things that require action upon. There's some things that do not require action upon. But Lord, show us the difference. We strengthen ourselves to come before you this morning. And Lord, we say in the name of Jesus... What shall we do? Shall we pursue? Shall we recover all? Or shall we just sit here? And we want to hear from the Lord. I got a feeling he's going to tell you to pursue him. Amen. And then you're going to find out the rest of the answer. Amen? Amen. Uh, I've never had God write out a plan in triplicate and, uh, you know, with a book and say, here, this is the plan for your life. Pick out the things you like. Take those and throw away the rest. No, that's not God. Amen? That's not God. But the submission to the Lord is going to be by faith and trusting in him and stepping out in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Anybody here that needs a healing, needs hands laid on them for healing for any particular reason whatsoever, my leadership is here to pray for you right after I close out the live stream in this this service. But we've been getting people healed. I mean, seeing people healed. I should have said that, said that way. God is doing miracles within the church if we'll, believers will come and believe and just trust him. Besides that is a command. It's not up to negotiation. Jesus said, go out there, oh, and lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. It's, it's not negotiable. Amen. Praise the Lord, so we want to do that part. Amen. Okay. Okay, hang on just for a minute. You, hang on. Let's go ahead. And go. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We pray blessing upon us. We thank, Lord, that you caused us to be blessed going out, blessed coming in. You made us the head and not the tail. We've got to keep reminding ourselves that sometimes. But you made us the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. We give you the praise this morning in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, I pray, pour out miracles upon this congregation this morning. Father God, that we can walk in the truth and the glory of God. And we give you praise. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah.